I don't know when you grew up going to school, and this will be different depending on how old you are, but there's a lot of things that maybe you were taught that now are irrelevant, right? Uh, for me, there was a couple of things. I know many of you can relate to this. In math class, why do we need to learn this? Well, they would always say, because you're not always going to have a calculator in your pocket. Well, so much for that. Um, I remember, I was probably one of the last like, people to go through this, learning cursive. And they told us we need to learn cursive so that uh, we could write, so it wouldn't take us as long to write stuff. So, you know, that's a good, good skill that we have. Um, I, probably music class. You guys remember this? Like, everyone would learn how to play music on a recorder. I mean, yeah, any, any professional recorder players? I mean, is that, is that a thing? So, you know, however that. Or how about this? Um, we had to learn how to use an encyclopedia. Or like, we actually had, like, a whole thing, a whole encyclopedia-like thing. You guys have some of those things? Uh, that way, you could always be up to date on information. That, I guess, apparently was, you know, a couple years old by the time you read it. Um, all that stuff, I mean, it was good. Obviously, it was helpful. But it's, it's because of times have changed, those things maybe are not as relevant then as they are now. And I share that because today as we continue our study in the first John, we're going to look at this question. Is Jesus relevant? Uh, is he? Or, or how is he still relevant? I think even those of us who are followers of Jesus, we would say, yes, he's relevant. He saves our soul. By his grace, we've been saved. We can be in the kingdom of God. But, but is there more to it, like today in 2024, than just having a Savior? How is Jesus actually relevant practically for us today? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning as we near the end of 1 John. So if you have a Bible, will you turn with me to 1 John chapter 5? Uh, this will be the second to last week, and the next week we'll end our time in 1 John. The book of 1 John was written by the disciple John around late 80s, early 90s AD, uh, towards the end of his life. Uh, it was written for kind of two primary reasons. One, to remind people of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So what does it mean to walk with him? And also to combat uh, some false teachings by a group that is now known as the secessionists, who were saying things about Jesus, teaching things about Jesus that were not true. For example, that he was not a, he was not a human being, he was just a divine spirit. Uh, that his uh, death on the cross, did it, like he didn't resurrect from the dead, and it didn't mean anything for us. Like his sacrifice was not atoning for us in any way. So there's a lot of uh, refuting here that John is doing to remind us who Jesus is, and he's going to continue to do that as we get to the end of his letter. First John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, here's what it says. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. So again, I just want to remind us, especially maybe if you're newer to this Jesus thing, that Christ is a title, not a name. So his name is not Jesus Christ, like Mr. Christ. Christ is actually a title. And it's a reminder here that that to be in the family of God it is not enough to believe Jesus was a simply a good person or a good example to follow or even just a prophet. So, so Christ means anointed one. It means that he is the Messiah, Messiah, the Savior. So we must believe not that he's a good person or a prophet or gave, was a good example, but he's actually the chosen one, the, the Savior, the one sent to save. And so to be in the family of God is to believe that Jesus, not you or your good works or your track record or your promise to be better in the future or anything else, none of those things make you good. Jesus does. Jesus does. And again, remember, John is in this letter, he's refuting false teachings about Jesus that have sprung up over the decades, and this is why he's writing this letter. The secessionists, which is the group of people who were in the church and had walked away and started teaching false things about Jesus, they had a lot of errant beliefs or teachings about who Jesus was, and it's reflected in the various allusions John gives us in this letter. Now, if you put them all together in the book, like the things that John is kind of refuting and teaching, it becomes clear that the secessionists denied that Jesus was the Christ. They denied that Jesus was God's son come in the flesh, that he was, while he was on earth, he was not just fully God, he was also a human being, fully human, not just a divine being. And, and they also deny that his death was both real and necessary, that his death, it was real, or sorry, real in the sense that he died and then he rose from the grave. They denied these things. And so in what John is telling us here is that if you deny Jesus, you do not actually know God, nor have you been born of God. If you deny Jesus, it doesn't matter how good you are, how spiritual you are, whatever, you do not actually know God or have been born of God. So the question is, what does it mean to be born of God? Well, in John chapter 1, in John's gospel, it says this, and when we get to these green words, we'll say them on the screen together, you can put it up. Here's what John says in chapter 1 of his gospel. But to all who, who did receive him, that is Jesus, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born out of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. That is how you 
be born of God. Being born of God is different than your natural uh, birth as a baby. It is something that God does through Jesus that is given to us by the Spirit of God when we trust in Christ our Savior. That, that Jesus' life, that Jesus' righteousness counts for us. And then what John tells us in John chapter 5, verse 1, is that everyone who loves the Father also loves the one who has been born of him. So if you love God, you will also love Jesus, his son. You can't just love God and deny Jesus. According to the scriptures, they would argue, the disciples would argue, you don't actually know the Father. Or put another way, you cannot be in the family of God apart from Jesus. You cannot be in the family of God apart from Jesus. This is what John is teaching us. Of course, he gets this from what Jesus teaches us in the Gospels, that you can be a good person. You can be a loving person. You can be a really hard worker. You can have a lot of really great qualities and still be outside the family of God because we need Jesus to do for us what we could not do, what what is not possible for us to do ourselves to be in the family of God. The good news of the gospel is not that Jesus came to save good people. It's that he came to be the perfect righteousness in our place, that he lived a perfect life. He took the wrath of God that our sins deserve, that anyone who trusts and believes in him can be welcomed into the family of God. That no matter how good you are or how bad you are, then you can be a Tar Heels fan and still receive the grace and mercy of God. And you can be a Duke fan, as you should, and that's not enough. You still need Jesus. You cannot be in the family of God apart from Jesus. And that is one of the main thrusts of this book, to remind us it's not just enough to be a quote-unquote good person or to believe God exists, but to trust in his Messiah, his Son, who stood in our place and took the wrath of God we deserved. And then if we continue reading, he says this in verse 2 of 1 John chapter 5. This is how we know that we love God's children. When we love God and obey his commands, for this is what the love of God is for us, to keep his commands. And his commands are not a burden, because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? In other words, here is how we know that we are in the family of God that we obey his commands and that we trust him, that we live how Jesus asks us to live. Really, to sum up the heart behind the commands and the wisdom of God, we've read this a lot, so we're going to read this one more time together. In 1 John chapter 3, John tells us what exactly it means to follow the commands of Jesus. It'll be on the screen. Here's what it says. Now, this is his command. This is Jesus' command. That we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And love one another as he commanded us. So so to be in the family of God requires two things. That we trust in Jesus and that we try to love as he loves. Which is sacrificially. Which is unfair. Which is not always, the other person doesn't always deserves it. Now what's interesting about this is that John says that Jesus' commands are not a burden. He says they're not a burden. And it is our faith in Christ that allows us to conquer the world. And by trusting in him, by living out his commands, we've done so. And they're not burdensome. Now, of course, John gets all of his ideas from Jesus. And this is how Jesus describes his commands in a well-known passage of Matthew chapter 11. I want to read it. And I want to explain to you something I think is uh, maybe quite interesting. In Matthew chapter 11, this is what Jesus says. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, a yoke metaphor is not something that we typically go around saying all the time. In the ancient world, it was quite common. A yoke was simply a wooden frame that typically would conjoin two animals together to pull something, to pull a heavy load. It was also a common religious metaphor for one person's subjugation or following of another. So you're going you're gonna to put on the yoke of this rabbi or the, the yoke of this leader and learn their ways. It was a common Jewish metaphor well, as well for the, for the law. So it was a common metaphor for the law. And so, in fact, you would expect a religious leader, a rabbi, for example, to have a yoke. 
right? Follow my ways, do what I do so that you can be like me. You can be a teacher like me, or you can follow the commands of God like me. It, it was actually quite normal for a religious leader to speak of having a yoke. And that's what Jesus does here. That, that's not what's surprising here. What, what's actually surprising here is not that Jesus says that he has a yoke to follow or to, to take on, to, to live out, but that he says that his yoke is easy and light. That, in an ancient context, would make you think, like, what is he talking about? See, the problem is that, the problem here is, is that loving the way of Jesus, if we, if you, you know, we, we've talked to this in 1 John, earlier this year we were in the book of James, um, it is objectively not easy. Like, it's not easy, right, to, to be forgiving to people who don't deserve it, to be generous with your money and your resources and your time, to go out of your way for others, not expecting anything in the return, like, Let's just be honest, following Jesus is not easy. In fact, it, quite opposite, it seems really hard. Like there are many times it's like, man, I have to do this, this is the right thing. I, I in my, my own flesh or my own desires, I don't want to do this. So how then, if, G, if following Jesus sometimes is hard, the way of Jesus is hard, how can he then say that it is easy and light? Well, here's how and here's why. That even when it isn't natural, for us, even when it feels burdensome for us to do to follow in the way of Jesus, the reason why it is easy and light is because in Jesus we have already overcome the world. What John is reminding us here is that in Christ you have already won. You are already an overcomer. You are already loved, forgiven, and accepted in Messiah Jesus because of what he has done for you. And here is how it's easy and light. It is not our following Jesus' yoke that earns us God's law, love or following the law that earns this God's approval. You are already loved. That's why Christ came. And it is out of that reality that we follow him. We don't follow him to get something from him. We follow him out of victory because his grace has already been given to us. We are loved, and so we love others out of that reality. Not I better love people enough so that God will love me. Right? Like there isn't a test for, for the follower of Christ. There's not a test where you have to work hard and study towards and then hope that one day you can pass it if you do enough good stuff. John's reminder here is, man, you're already in. Like the pressure is off. The pressure's off. It makes me think of our oldest daughter, Finley, uh, just finished third grade. And she's like, you know, she's the kind of kid that like always wants to do the right thing. And so sometimes she stresses out about school and grades. And like our philosophy, and other people are different, like our philosophy for Christine and I, is we want our kids to do the best they can in school, but we are more concerned with how they treat others and how they respect their teachers than the grades that they get. So we tell them all the time, we honestly, like, <laughs> we don't care about your grades as long as you try. Like, we care what you try. But if we get a bad report about your behavior, that is something we're going to deal with. And so they know this. We talk about this all the time. But she's getting nervous. She wants to do really good on her end-of-grade test, her EOGs. And they talk about a lot. Understandably, hey, it's your first time, whatever. So she's nervous. And so for the few weeks coming up with her EOGs, we kept trying to remind her, like, hey, we love you. It's okay. Like, just do your best. You don't have to, you know, it's okay. If you don't you get a great grade, we honestly don't really care. Like, we, you're, we love you. Just do the best you can. And then a couple of nights before Finley's EOGs, I reminded her again. I was having a conversation. I was like, how are you feeling? And she was like, kind of nervous. And I said, hey, Finley, do you want to know what grade, what scores I got on my third grade EOG? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, I have no idea. I have no idea. No idea. Because it doesn't matter. I was like, Finley, it does not matter what grade you get. Just do the best that you can. And the night before the EOG, EOGs, I asked her again, how you feeling? Are you nervous? And she, she said, no, I'm okay. And I was like, how are you really feeling, Finley? I'm like, it's okay to say you're nervous. She's like, no, I'm just going to do my best. It doesn't matter what grades I get. And for me, I'm like, that's the thing. Now, she might have been lying a little bit, and that's okay. You guys but like, I want her to know, like, we love you. Just do the best, but you are loved, you are our daughter, you're a part of this family. No matter what grades you get, that's not define who you are. And for us, the reminder for us here is that the burden is lifted because there is now a desire to want to love. Not out of compulsion or out of obligation, but rather in response to the love that you have been given. And so maybe, can, can I encourage you this morning, man, if you're thinking like, I know God loves me, but I don't always like do the things that I'm supposed to do. And so I, I feel like a bad Christian or I feel like I'm not measuring up. Um, can I just remind you this morning that Jesus took your burden. He took your burden. There is no test for you to pass. There is no thing that you got to do to prove that you actually love God. What you do is you repent of your sins. You trust that Jesus' sacrifice counted for you. And through the power of the Spirit, to the best of your ability, you walk with Him. And sometimes you get a bad grade, and sometimes you fall, and sometimes you don't measure up. 
And then you simply are honest with Jesus and you, he get his, graces, his grace is renewed every morning. He took your burden. Listen, if you're a follower of Christ, the good news for us this morning is you're on the winning team. In verse 4, when he says uh, that, that there is victory that has conquered the world, it is our faith. Again, it's not our, it's not our effort. It's not our, look how awesome we are. It's not who we vote for. It is our faith in Jesus that makes us conquerors. That you don't have to attempt to earn it, but it's been given. And so now we are free to love others because we have nothing to prove and no one to impress. One of the things we say often here at New City Church is that if you are in Christ, you have nothing to prove because Jesus' perfect life proved it for you. And you have no one to impress because if you are in Christ, God looks at you the same way he looks at Jesus, which is righteous, holy, blameless, redeemed. You have nothing to prove. You have no one to impress. That is, burden, that is burdenless. That is freedom. That Jesus took your burden. Took your burden. That you thought you had to do one thing, but he accomplished it for you. One more story. It reminds me. <laughs> uh, maybe get a little trouble here. Uh, when I was a kid, we had, a, in our, we, had like, we had an outdoor fridge in our garage, in our neighborhood. And we would often have, so, have sodas in there. So there were many times where me and my friends... We would take sodas and we would drink them. And then um, right outside our neighborhood, there was a road because that's, well, that's how neighborhoods work. There's a road and then it goes to your street. You turn off. So the, the main road right outside our neighborhood, sometimes we would, you know, 10, 11, 12, uh, we would take our soda cans and we would put them on the road after we finished drinking them for cars to run over them. So we would take our soda can, we put it on the road, and then, and then we would hide in the bushes and like watch cars hit them. And typically they like avoid them and sometimes they run them over. And so one time there was like three of us and we finished our soda can. We put it on the road and we weren't trying to be malicious. We were just like, oh, this is funny. You run over car or your soda cans. And so this car runs over this one of our soda cans and slams on their brakes. And we're in the bushes. We're like, uh-oh. So like we like go outside the back of the bushes. And so there's a main road here and then there's a cul-de-sac and you have to like drive around. And so we like run into the cul-de-sac because we're like, we don't want him to like find us. So we're in the cul-de-sac and we're like, that was close. And all of a sudden we hear this car like speeding down the cul-de-sac. And we're like, uh-oh. It was the same car that ran over our soda cans. And he comes speeding to us. He has his window rolled down, and we're like, oh, we're about to, we're about to die. He's like 20-something years old, and I'm like, this, it was fun, boys. We had a good, we had a good run. Like, he's going to kill us. And so I'm thinking, like, oh, we're in trouble. He's like, was that your soda cans? And we're just like, yeah. He's like, listen. And I'm like, here it goes. Like, we're dead. He's, what did he say? He said, listen, you got to do that bleep at night where people can't see you, not during the day. <laughs> and so he's, like, coaching us on, like, how to get people to do stupid stuff. Right? And so the moment we're like so scared, he's going to kill us. He's like, no, man, it's cool. you got to just do a better job of this. Now, why am I sharing that story? Because uh, it's awesome, number one. But number two, man, listen, we don't perform for God. We walk with him. And so just like this guy that's like cussing at us to do a better job of like putting people's things in front of their cars to be ran over, it's just like Jesus, man. If we follow Jesus, man, this is how I do it. My burdens are easy and light that you just Walk with me, that you repent of your sins, that you know that my grace is sufficient for you, that Jesus took our burden, and that's what makes us conquerors. And then in verse 6, John continues by saying this, Jesus Christ, that's Jesus Messiah, he is the one who came by water and blood, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Now, I'm sure that verse makes a lot of sense, so we're just going to keep reading. Verse 7. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you're like, what in the world? He came by water and blood, not by water only, and then the Spirit testifies. Let me just, give me a second. Let me explain to you what's likely going on here. Again, it's helpful to rem remember that John is refuting false, some, some false teachings. However, there's not like we have this like ancient first century document. Here is what the secessionists were teaching. We don't know. We just have to infer based on the things that John is writing about. And based on what John writes in this letter, you get an idea. Again, the session is here in this passage, seem to agree with John that Jesus came by water, but disagreed that he also came by blood. Again, he says he is the one who came by water, but not water only, by water and the blood. So there seems to be some agreement. The sessionists are like, he came by water, but he didn't come by blood, but he came by water only. So, so what's happening here? Well, water could be a few things, but most likely here's what it is. Most likely when you study the gospel of John and the letter of 1 John, the, the water reference is either a reference to Jesus' baptism by, the, um, by John the Baptist to start his ministry, or by Jesus' baptizing ministry, that Jesus himself didn't baptize, but his disciples did, to follow in the way of Jesus. Uh, regardless whether it's a reference to Jesus' baptism or Jesus' ministry, uh, basically what's happening here, there is some sort of agreement that Jesus had some sort of ministry. Obviously, the secessionists also believe that Jesus was teaching things. He had a ministry. That's what they would agree with. So he came by water. He had a, a baptizing ministry. 
However, what they don't agree with is that it came by the blood. That's where the disagreement is. The question is, well, what is the blood? Well, the blood, we know, is a reference to Jesus' death and his resurrection. We know that because in 1 John chapter 1, of this letter, it'll be on the screen. Here's what John says. He says, if we walk in the light as he, that is Jesus himself, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the blood. So, so the water is a reference to Jesus' ministry that he baptized and that people come into the kingdom through him. And then the blood refers to his laying down of his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then he resurrected to new life. In 1 John chapter 2, it says that Jesus is our advocate, even to this day, that Jesus' sacrifice counted for you. The secessionists are arguing against that, that his blood, that his death, that his resurrection doesn't mean anything because Jesus obviously in their mind didn't even resurrect. Why would you do that? That's not possible. And so they argue that Jesus did not rise from the dead, that he wasn't therefore the anointed Messiah. And in fact, what John says here is actually the Holy Spirit also testifies. The Spirit of God also does testify that this is true. In fact, in first, it's not in first John, in John chapter 15, of John's gospel, we are told that the role of the Spirit is to bear witness to the truth about Jesus. The Spirit convicts us of our sins and bears truth that Jesus is Lord. And so what John is saying here in verse 6 is that G- G- Jesus is the Messiah. His blood counted for you, that he is the Savior of the world. And then in verse 7, he continues by saying this, For there are three that testify. So there are three things that testify that Jesus' blood counted for you. Verse 8, the Spirit the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given about his son. Now, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, important issues were decided with the testimony of two to three witnesses. So you often, you couldn't just say like, hey, I saw somebody do this. You'd have to have two to three people that would come together to corroborate a story. And so that, that witness's theme is picked up here in 1 John, that John is saying, here is why you can, why you should, how you can believe what I am saying about Jesus. Now, I know it's strange and confusing for us because we don't do like the two to three test witnesses thing. Maybe you could kind of think of like a, a 12-person jury, maybe that's kind of helpful. But what John is doing in an ancient context is he's arguing that there are multiple things that we can look to to see who Jesus really was. And these three things testify together. The water, the spirit, and the blood. The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, says that he is this who I'm well pleased, that he convicts us of our sin, he draws us to Jesus. The water, that is Jesus' ministry, who he was, what he did, and what he taught, and then his atoning death for us. These three, three things are in agreement that Jesus is the Messiah. That this isn't just, and what John is making here, this, isn't a, this is a really serious claim by John, okay? That God himself, what John, according to John, God himself is behind what John is teaching. That this isn't just John's testimony about Jesus. It is who God is saying Jesus is. Or put another way, maybe to put put a spin on another thing we say often here at New City Church. I think what John, you could be saying here is this. That scripture is a unified story that leads to Jesus or it's nothing. It's a unified story that leads to Jesus or it's nothing. Now, when I say nothing, obviously the Bible is important, even if, it's, if you would argue, hey, it's not true, because it has lots of history. It's had a very big impact of the world. It's, a, it's very influential of the world. Not, I just, when I say nothing, I don't say like it doesn't matter. Well, my point here is that they are, the scriptures either are true when they teach us about God, or they don't. And if they're wrong about who God, who God is, they are irrelevant for us spiritually. They do not help us spiritually. They either show us who God is and how we can know him, or they are no benefit to us actually knowing who God is if the God of the scriptures is not who God actually is. Like, there's not a middle ground here. Either what they say about Jesus is true, we should trust it, and we can know God through Jesus, through the word, or it's wrong. And if it's wrong, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter what it says. It, it doesn't matter what John writes or what the Gospels say. It's either a unified story that leads to Jesus and it's true and its testimony is true, or it is unhelpful for us. It's either true or it's not. It reminds me, I had this weird experience when I was an undergrad. I went to UNC Wilmington. 
And I eventually became a religious studies major. Now, secular university, religious studies, is not, it's not Christian studies. It's like studies of all world religions. And so most of the professors in the department were either agnostic or atheist. And there was a couple of Christian uh, professors, or at least claimed to be Christians. And, um, and two of them, I was so confused. And I was younger at this point, so like I'm not going like to confront my professors. But I, I had two that had like either like privately or I like mentioned something about their faith. And one was, um, they, but, but what was confusing to me is they, they said they were Christians, but what they taught in the classroom was like completely against what they believed to be true. And uh, for example, one of the professors was a, um, was a practicing devout Catholic. And, but she was like very clear and she would even say sometimes in the classroom, like here's what, you know, separating what I believe from like what academic research says. And I remember thinking like, okay, if, if your understanding of the academic studies of certain religious text or whatever says this, and you think that's true, then why are you a Christian? Like, if you believe they're teaching contradictory things, th- then why are you a Christian? And I'm like, it's like either it's true or it was just very weird to me. Like, if, if you believe this is true about this or who wrote this or this is what actually happened and this part of the Bible is, like, not accurate, like, what are you doing? Like, it seems like a waste of time to me. I was very confused. And then I had a, my, my academic advisor. He was an elder at the church that he was a part of. And I, I don't know what church he was part of, not that it really matters. Um, but, I, but how he taught in class, like, I never liked I was like, when, I, when he told me he was a Christian, I'm not sure how, he, how it happened, but I was like very surprised. Like, you don't seem like, but things that you say, like you teach one thing, but, you're, but, but then you say privately believe something else. And we have this conversation one time. Um, I went for, in, in college, I spent a summer in Beirut, Lebanon with crew. It was a campus ministry. And so I spent a summer there. And I think it was after, it was after either I came back or before I went. And I guess the conversation came up. And somehow we got talking about like mission stuff. And he told me with like this frustration and even anger in his voice that he was really annoyed with Christian missionaries who, stru- who smuggled Bibles into China. I'm not sure how this topic came up, but I remember like being super confused. I'm like, okay, whatever the law, they don't want to bring Bibles in. Okay. But if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, if you believe that he is the only way for us to receive salvation, why are you upset that Christians are smuggling Bibles to close off countries? Like, I didn't understand. Like, like, this is true or it's not. Like, it's not just about us gathering together to feel good about what we're doing here or to, like, be friends or, like, to sing some karaoke and to listen to sometimes maybe a decent TED talk and sometimes a bad one. Like, what are we doing? We are wasting our time if scriptures are not a unified story that leads to our Messiah. And that's what John is saying here. Man, this stuff is true. And he's claiming that it's not just his idea, but it is God's testimony. And then verse 10, it says this, the one who believes in the Son of God, that this testimony, that has this testimony within himself, the one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his Son. So John is calling these teachers straight up, liars. Like they're not even wrong. They are lying. Now, of course, John's strong language here is directed towards these people who are making false claims about Jesus. So, so it's kind of charged language on purpose because they're leading, literally leading, leading people astray and to, and, and to death. So he has harsh language for them. However, regardless if somebody is like intentionally trying to deny Jesus or unintentionally or maybe apathetically going about their life, it is still true that to deny Jesus is to make God a liar if Jesus was sent by God as the Christ and as the Messiah. To deny that Jesus is the Son of God is to make God the Father a liar. That's what he says here. And then to close, the last two verses we'll read this morning, he says this in verse 11. And this is the testimony. These are what the three things agree with. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. That's how you get eternal life. Through trusting and believing in Jesus. Verse 12, the one who has the son has life. The one who does not have the son does not have life. If you want life, that's how you have it. Now here's the great news, man. The great news is is that anyone... Anyone can have true life, that you can have true life right now. And according to the scriptures, or because according to the scriptures, it is given through Jesus. That means like right now in the midst of your sin or your shame or your doubts, like you can have life, you can have grace, you can have love and you can have mercy because it's not dependent on you. It's dependent on Jesus. And so we should read this passage and ask ourselves, do you have life? Do you have life? Do you trust that Jesus is the Messiah whose righteousness counted 
for you. That he took the right righteousness of God, the wrath of God against sin and evil and wickedness on his shoulders so that you could experience the grace and mercy of God that you do not deserve. And for those of us that are followers of Jesus this morning, man, do we actually like believe this and remember this stuff? Or are we constantly thinking, well, I got to go to church today because I had a bad week and I wasn't a good husband or a good wife and I kind of got mad at my coworkers or I yelled at my kids and so I kind of like got to come to church to make penance. And that's not life. Remember, Jesus took your burden. That grace is available to you every day, not just on Sundays. Every single day, you and I can have life because of what Jesus offers to us. And so to the question this morning is that, is Jesus relevant? Is Jesus relevant? Well, here's, I think, what John would say maybe to summarize this. That whoever finds Jesus finds life. If you want life, then Jesus is relevant to you. Eternal life, grace, mercy, love, grace, forgiveness, and acceptance is given by and through Jesus. So can I just say, hey, if life is hard right now, here's the good news. Because of Jesus, this is not the end. If you are suffering or if you are grieving, this is not the end. That we have an unimaginable future because of God's kingdom. And it is offered to you by God through Christ. And so, again, we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. Because we know one day Jesus will wipe every tear from our eye. There will be no more lying, cheating, stealing, or death. But that day is not this day. And so we hold out hope and trust. And so, listen, some of us uh, might be believing. Some of us might believe, rather, in Jesus, but have a hard time believing, like, um, man, that, that, that Jesus, like, his righteousness counted for me. Can I just like encourage you like, that we would love to pray for you, encourage you, walk with you. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, here in a second, we're going to have people down front. And we'd love to like pray for you. That today might be the day that you can experience life. And if you are a follower of Jesus and life is just beating you up, we'd love to pray and grieve and just encourage you as well. That if this is true, that whoever finds Jesus finds life, then those of us that are followers of Jesus, we should also ask ourselves, man, who do I need to tell? Who do I need to tell? I've maybe shared this a couple times. If you were here with us uh, back in June, one Sunday, we did a a church-wide survey, asked a couple of things. Uh, One of the things was, how did you hear about New City? One of the questions was, how long have you been coming to New City? And the overwhelming majority of people who have been coming to New City for over three years were personally invited by a friend. Personally invited by a friend. The majority of people who had been coming for over one year were personally invited by a friend. So social media, online stuff, this stuff is great. But just an invitation an invitation that your coworker or your friend might desperately need can come by you to make an eternal difference in their life. Whoever finds Jesus in the midst of darkness, doubts, depression, and hardships, life is waiting for them, and it's waiting for you. So let's pray. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.